Here we go. Oh, and we're live. Hello, okay. Ken. Okay, was that that That's quick it. and that easy? It's that easy, yeah. yeah. We didn't say very much interesting before starting. No, we we're were... Just starting, and then you just said, shut the fuck I up. I said, hold that thought, please. <laughs> this uh, this concept of things getting better. And you know, we were talking about war, war being... Because there's a World War II helmet that... Um, Shane Against the Machine is the gentleman's name. He's made me another uh, sculpture, and he started making sculptures out of uh, these World War II helmets with uh, a lamp underneath it and an actual real World War II bayonet as well. And you were saying war is a terrible idea. Yeah, and it's going away. You think really? really yeah, re really fast. And you, you mentioned Pinker. Yeah. And that's, you know, everything I will say is redundant to Pinker. I mean, that um, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature is one of, I think, the most subversive books of our time. You know, people are, there's such a, um, it's a fetish to suffer. It's a fetish to say how bad things are. People are getting really off on it. And when you start saying, you know, after you say one death by violence is too many and we got to clean up the environment and da 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 say all that stuff and it's all true, but you can also take a breath and say things are getting better. Yeah, I think we need to recognize that. And the, the problem is there is there is violence. There is horrible things. There are horrible things in the world. They, they still exist. And now they're magnified because of the fact that we have this ability to look at it on your phone anytime you want to. Yeah. Look at it on your computer you know, anytime it's the same you want thing. To. It's the same thing. I think calories and information are identical. You know, for millions, billion yeah. years, um, the biggest problem every living thing had was too few calories. And then for... Uh, what, maybe 75 years, a very small percentage of the animals in the world had this problem of too many calories. And there's nothing that prepares anybody for that. Mm. We now have more information in one issue of the New York Times than um, a 17th century peasant would have had in their entire life. So we have this glut of information that we're dealing with about as well as we dealt with calories. <laughs> I talk about this quite often, but the way I describe it is diet and that most people have a poor diet and that most people's diet is not nutritious. Right. And if you have a poor diet that's not nutritious, your body becomes unhealthy. Well, if you have a poor mental diet, yeah. and I've discussed, how many people do we talk about this with? Like three or four people we've been talking about this, like taking in information you should almost think of it as a mental diet because if you take in bad information all the time and, negative information and i will speak for myself but i don't think i'm in any way alone i often forget where i read stuff oh yeah so i, I have to be really careful to not read too much garbage yeah or it just pops up in my head as oh that's real right you know so i try to go with uh, news sources that are, i think are pretty reliable even if i disagree with them like mm -hmm. i try to read the times because i know there's a level to how much they're going to lie you know, we <laughs> yeah. know we know where the parameters of their lying are you know yeah. we know where they do the spin and if you just just pop around the web at random you can't tell what what kind of information you're getting but i also want to add to this you know it's it's exactly the way i feel about drugs you know as much as i want to say this is not right for me information has to be out there and all information absolutely no gatekeepers you know no i i completely agree and i think that we're coming very close to a time where technology allows us to understand what's true and what's not true we're not there yet yeah. but i think we're we're really close to being able to have some sort of an ability to read minds to to de decipher information like really clearly but, but the problem with reading minds um, if we could do it mm -hmm. and the, to ascertain truth is uh, truth is very different from what someone believes. Yes. You know, if you had a perfect lie detector, it would not help you with criminality at all. Because, you know, people that think they're innocent may very well think they're innocent, even if they are not. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good point. And, you know, another really good point is memory is very fallible. Oh, well, yeah. See, I, uh, you know, I get a lot of, I got a lot of shit for this. And I talked about it a little bit on, on my podcast, but, um, you know, I was in the room with Trump a lot. You know, I, I did two tours. Of, yeah. I did two tours of duty. <laughs> on oh, tell, tell me about that. What is that like? Because I know, was supposed to do that show and I passed on it. Yeah, I was like, I don't want to live in New York for three months or whatever it was. Like, yeah, it just seemed like a. Uh, it's wise either way. It was a it was a uh, primetime television show, so it sold tickets. 
and that mm. is our job, right. uh, and that's what we do. And I went on with one idea in my head. You know, Annie Duke, you know, the poker player? Mm -hmm. She had been on the year before, and I said, um, why am I going on? I mean, I know, I know I'm going to sell tickets, and that's, that's just a done deal, but why am I going on? What's my real goal? And she said, go on and show that atheists can be kind. That'll be your only goal for the whole show. Oh. Because they're going to jump on you for being an atheist. And they'll jump all over you for that. And just show that you're the one that gets mad the least. Show the one that you're, you're the nicest guy on there and you're the hardcore atheist. And I went, okay, that's a good goal. But then you sit in the room, and I don't know how well you know the President of the United States. I don't want to know him at all. Yeah. Um, but you spend um, uh, about two or three hours every other day sitting in a room across the table like this with a table you can't put your hands on. Why can't you put your hands on it? Because it might mar it. it oh, might that's put, hilarious. put a handprint on it. They literally tell you don't put your hands on the don't table? Don't put your hands on the table. And you have to sit up straight. And the camera, <laughs> if you're like the team captain, which by the way, they hate it if you call them team captain. <laughs> they like to have it, you know, some sort of business jargon. Mm. And you're in, a, you're in a set. And that's the thing that Everybody else on the show would say, we're going into the boardroom now. And I'd say, no, we're going on to the boardroom set. <laughs> so it wasn't a real boardroom? No, of course not. None what, of was it, it was real. Was it in a soundstage? Uh, it, was, you know, it was in the Trump Towers, but they'd oh. taken over a floor and NBC g guts it and puts up this shit. And then you got your <laughs> camera, that's your hero camera, that's um, over your shoulder that's shooting Trump. So you can't lean into the camera. Right. And they want a little piece of you so you can't lean out of the camera. So then you've got about two hours where you sit up straight and you can't move side to side and you can't put your hands on the table and you listen to someone speak for two hours that they're going to try to edit out to get three minutes where he sounds okay. Okay. What does he have to say for two hours? He will talk. He would talk. I mean, things obviously have changed, but he would talk about... Uh, I was reading this blog on the internet that said I didn't sell my property for enough, and I bought it for $3 million, and I sold it for $4 million. Isn't that a profit? Isn't that a profit? What do you think? Isn't that a profit? Yeah, that would be a million dollars profit. Well, they said I sold it for too less, they, too little. Okay. Who was this? It was somebody on the internet. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, he'd be arguing in front of us with perhaps a 18-year-old guy on the internet who thought that Donald Trump should have made more from a real estate deal. And this is something he really concentrates on. He seems to... Um, Still to this day. Yeah. Obsessed yeah. with what anybody says about him anytime. That's so odd. And uh, I thought, and I, I want to say this very clearly, um, I thought he was wonderful at his job. You know, if you had someone who was actually a business person um, on that show, it would be the worst show in the world because Bill Gates would make proper decisions. <laughs> right. And there'd be no surprises. You want someone capricious and crazy with no filter. That's what you want. Right. And that's what we got. So he makes arbitrary decisions that you try, you know, the human brain tries desperately to make those make sense. And that ends up being some kind of entertainment. And um, so I actually, uh, actually, uh, Donald Trump Jr. said to me, you know, of all the people we've had on the show, you seem like the only person who's ever liked my father. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you actually seem to like him. And I said, you know, I have a fascination and a respect and a um, affection for people who are able to get out of their filters. And I said, some people do that with pure genius, like Bob Dylan. Some people do it with bravery, like Lenny Bruce. Some people do it with drugs, you know, Neil Young, perhaps, uh, Jimi Hendrix, perhaps. And most people do it with a mixture of stuff. But I said, um, Thelonious Monk said, the genius is the one who is most like himself. And I said, with some sort of um, mental problems coupled with um, greed and a lack of compassion, your father has somehow found a way to throw off the filters. And I will listen to Tiny Tim talk 
on tape for hours because I like that little bit of Asperger's and all that other stuff. Well, I'm, I, I'm not assuming quali- I'm not qualified to, right, to, yeah. to, to, to but I'm saying that's He's possible. An oddity. Yeah, it's for oddity. Sure. I can hear him talk forever. I can listen to Lenny Bruce. You know, Hal Wilner has those hundreds of hours of him just ranting on his tape. I, I think I don't like people on drugs that much, but boy, I do. And I listen to uh, uh, Lenny Bruce talk forever. And uh, Donald Trump had the dark side of that. You know, it was almost like when I was hitchhiking around the country and, you know, homeless and shit, and you'd end up at a biker place and, you know, some clubhouse and some guys just holding court and ranting. I've always been interested in the people who are out on the margins, you know? And what what Donald Jr. Um, took as affection, I, I guess was a bit of affection, but it's also that if you have thrown off some filters... I'll listen to you talk. And um, so that was that. It was very, very strange. And then um, I really did spend a lot of time kind of sticking up for Donald Trump saying, yeah, there's interesting stuff there. And yeah, he's, he's crazy and he's venal and um, he's empty. Uh, you know, really weird stuff that you've never seen before. You have never seen someone who has never laughed sincerely and never made a joke. Never laugh sincerely. No, he, he, will, he will laugh in a bully way. <laughs> you look kind of fat, Joe. Really? Yeah, he'll do that. But he won't laugh at himself. Oh, oh no. And also, but never a even a joke. Even but he a, says funny things on Twitter. Did you see the thing he did on Twitter the other day where he put a picture of Trump Tower in Greenland and he said, I promise not to do this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I laughed. Mm-hmm. That was funny. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. a giant Trump Tower in the middle of Greenland. I never saw it. I mean, I saw that. But tweet. you never saw him in person. I never saw him in funny. person. I also never saw him show any enjoyment or understanding of music. Oh. And those two things are two things that I connect with people very much on. I so, do too. But one of my best friends, Doug Stanhope, does yeah, not yeah. like music. Oh yeah, yeah. I know. He's Doug like, doesn't. I fucking hate music. It's like, <laughs> And Teller's father. <laughs> really? Teller's father didn't like music. I mean, I don't know. I mean, and aggressively didn't like music. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But I, I do know that I don't, I don't believe that we see things the same way. Like, I don't think we taste things the same way, which is why some people enjoy certain kinds of foods and some people hate those exact same foods. Some people, the music sounds different to people yeah, but in terms of like what what their emotional and psychological makeup is and what it does to them. Some people don't want to have none of it, and that's stand up. When I lost uh, all that weight, you lost over a hundred pounds. Congratulations! And by I the read way. a lot, and also more importantly, four years and kept it off. But um, uh, when I was reading about taste, I read this book, and I, I no, it's, it's awful that I can't bring up the name, but. Um, a woman wrote this wonderful book about uh, preferences in food, and she was trying to set up a dichotomy. Let's talk to those people who think there's a natural taste and desire in food, and those that think it's all environment and what you in memory and so on. And you just can't find scientists on the other side. All of our food preferences are habit, and there's nothing else. Habit. It's just habit. Is that proven? How it's, can they prove it that? It seems to be uh, lots of studies uh, with young children, um, lots of studies with people who they control their well, diet. How do you, but how do you make, how does it make sense when you have two kids that have radically different tastes and they grow up in the same household and they have essentially uh, yeah. very, very similar food experiences? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know how they tease out that, but they've I have done one some daughter, mm-hmm. one daughter who loves spicy food. Mm -hmm. And she's young. She's Mm -hmm. nine. And I love spicy food. And I mean, this fucking kid can eat jalapenos. Mm -hmm. She eats habanero sauce. She'll like, I'll say this one might be a little too hot for you. She's like, let me try it. Mm -hmm. And she'll like dip her finger in it. She's like, put it on. She'll eat chicken (laughs) with habanero sauce. I mean, she's a little savage. My other one doesn't want to have nothing to do with it. She she thinks everything's too hot. Like Mm -hmm. a little bit of pepper. She's like, oh, it's too hot. But you know, I, I found... When my uh, when I when I changed my diet so radically, that my comfort foods changed and my habits changed and what I liked changed. You know, a lot of that is because of gut bacteria. Oh, I know that. Oh, yeah, microbiome. Fascinating. Really fascinating stuff. And feeding back to your brain. You know, uh, that was the thing that was so so strange, including your emotions. Yes, very much so. But when I uh, I became plant based vegan um, for health reasons. And I wrote in my book, I wrote a lot of stuff about I am an unethical vegan. I'm not doing this for any sort of animal 
any sort of anim- lack of animal cruelty, nothing. Strictly health. That's why I'm doing the plants. End of story. And this has happened to a lot of friends of mine who changed that. After whatever it takes, and people are guessing like three months, four months of, um, of no animal products, uh, those little critters eating shit in your, in your guts die that like the meat stuff, and they're not giving that feedback loop. And I just found a real emotional change where mm. all of a sudden I went, I, I don't want to be part of that, um, of the suffering. Yeah. yeah. It was really strange how that changed. And it really felt to me, uh, I so want to, uh, I, you know, hardcore atheist, as you know, and um, I don't believe in a mind-body separation at all. And yet, I seem to believe that when I was 350 pounds, that um, none of that affected my emotion. And then I lost all this weight and found there were so many changes in me that seemed to be intellectual and emotional. And actually, I had a lot of evidence were physical. Well, there's and a it lot really of people. fucked me up on the mind-body separation. Well, it thing. should fuck you yeah. up because a lot of people make these assumptions that you know you are not your body, and a lot of very intelligent people they eschew working out and they don't want to exercise, and they find it like it's a vanity thing. Mm-hmm. It, it seems egotistical. They they don't they don't like it, and so they put it in this category of kind of knucklehead dumb things to do. Mm-hmm. But your body and your mind are all in the same it's house. It's all the same thing. Yeah. yeah. If your house is filled with shit, it doesn't help the and way you think. It was so amazing how I, I I mean, I completely believed that, yeah. and yet I wasn't living that. Mm-hmm. I was like thinking that I was living this, you know. 2000 year old idea of little homunculus who's kind of living inside me who's this pure pen and then the body is just the vehicle it's driving around in well, if and I that's just he- not true help you with that i think knowing you as long as i've known you you're an intense thinker and you your mind is something you I mean, you cherish your thoughts and you you embrace them and you're you're a very intelligent guy and i think you just probably rejected the idea that there was anything outside of the mind that had any influence on you. Yeah, we also talked about this. I was also, you know, I was the biggest guy to ever go through my school. So uh, my, my small high school in Western Massachusetts, you know, so I was I was six seven, and they wanted me center of the basketball team. They wanted all this stuff. And those kinds of people and that kind of culture, you know, I wanted to listen to music. I wanted to read. And I set up this... You guys who are physical, I don't like you. I'm on a different team. Yeah. You know, yeah. and my dislike of competitions and teams became a team thing. Yes. You know, you, <laughs> yes. that's the thing you always get stuck in. Yes. You know, the, the, the dislike of teams becomes your team. And I'm trying so hard now to think I have two choices, one or seven billion. And there's no teams between that. Hmm. I can either be myself or I can be one of all humanity. Or I won't even say 7 billion. Let's say 108 billion, the number of people who have lived in history. Hmm. You know, those are the people I can be. It's why I'm trying to not, and this is impossible to do, by the way. I'm talking about how I'm, I'm explaining to you how I'm driving myself crazy. Right. I'm not giving you real information. (laughs) Um, I'm trying to not think ever of us and them. Mm. But I'm trying to say those of us who voted for Trump, those of us who believe this. Mm. So it's always us because, man, I am so fucking sick of teams. And I even look back and go, you know, I love the Velvet Underground. I hated the fucking Eagles. And that was a fucking team. And that was manipulated and forced upon me. You know what I mean? I wanted to be the kind of guy that went from, you know, Zappa to the Velvet Underground to to Bob Dylan. That was all okay. And the Eagles and the Doobie Brothers, they were not what I listened to. I'm just trying to let that go. Yeah, you wanted to be one of the cool kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And whenever you want that, you got to say, well, you're one of the cool kids. That's the 108 billion who've lived on this planet. Yeah, that's a great way to look at things. And I think 
I wish people taught that in school, the dangers of being involved in teams. Because we get involved in teams in terms of like, you know, you're playing basketball or whatever. But but teams in terms of like the what, what I believe versus what you believe. And I think we're experiencing that politically right now with the most polarizing time in, in, in my lifetime that I've ever, ever been and, experiencing. And worldwide. Yes. Worldwide. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it is, not, it is yeah. not an American thing. Right. And uh, it, it's just insane. And I also know that's why I said, you know, I, I try to go with the Velvet Underground and the Eagles because that's where I can really see where I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, I, that I'm wrong. How do you deny Victim of Love? That's a great goddamn <laughs> song, man. Okay. Once Joe exactly. Walsh got in the mix, the Eagles changed. You that's know, what people have to recognize. I was in the middle of the China Sea with Joe Walsh uh, through, a, through a series of odd coincidences. When? That I had. Well, just, uh, just last year, we oh, got this wow. gig. Uh, Paul Allen. Who was one of the sure, Microsoft guys? Microsoft. Sure, sure, sure. Well, he's a great guy, right? And he I hear book, great things about he him. He books us to be on a cruise uh, to do a show for his friends. He's got like 200 friends, and he's bought this fucking cruise ship. He's rented this fucking cruise ship, thrown off all the chefs and everything, bring on his own people. Whoa. And they're going to go from, um, from Kobe to Shanghai, and he wants the entertainment to be Jay Leno, Penn and & Teller, and Ringo Starr. Whoa. Okay, that's what it's going to be on the China Sea on a cruise boat for like 200 people. And he books it. And as I said to my friend, Piff the Magic Dragon, I said, do you know how much it costs to shut down Penn and Teller in Vegas and fly us all to fucking Japan to be on a cruise ship to do a fucking Penn and Teller show and then come back? Do you have any idea how much that costs? And Piff said, no. And I said, me neither. But it must be a lot. You got to talk to my managers or something because that must be a shit ton of money so he books this whole thing and then paul allen dies right oh. dies so you know glenn who you met out there the long-suffering glenn who who uh, our manager he calls up you know after a few days and says really sorry for your loss and we'll trade in the tickets and get you the money back and we we can probably rebook those those weeks so it's not going to cost you anything and so sorry but no no we're still doing it and Glenn goes, well, you, we're, 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 he, the person that booked us is dead. <laughs> we're still doing this gig? And they go, yeah, yeah. And we went, okay. And I said to Glenn, you know, now that we can work for dead people, our career's going to take <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, because that opens up the market, right? Right. Um, so turns out that his friends, you know, Paul Allen's friends were people like Joe Walsh and Billy Gibbons and all these food scientists and all these great people. So there I am in the middle of the uh, China Sea with um, with uh, Joe Walsh on stage just at three in the morning playing piano for like 15 people and, uh, you know, singing Desperado and those kinds of things and talking to Joe Walsh and stuff and going, now, why exactly was I on a different team from Joe Walsh? Yeah. Why exactly was I on the Lou Reed team instead of the Joe Walsh team? Maybe you know? it was the big Lebowski influence team. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was that. <laughs> maybe it was that. But it's, it's, just, um, it's just trying to be more and more inclusive is just yeah. a, a really difficult thing to do. It is. And Whether it's, it's also the jocks become... and the music guys or all that yeah. stuff. Just everybody be Everybody. You can become a prisoner of those thoughts and those those things you espouse. Like when you start saying, fuck the Eagles, like you're yeah, stuck. Yeah, you're yeah, stuck with yeah. fuck the Eagles. And then when you start to realize that, you know, when the clash was hitting in the U.S., there were people sitting around a boardroom going, how do we get 20-year-old assholes to buy this shit? Right. <laughs> you know, yes. it, it was all being done and laid out, and that's fine. That's their job, and that's yes. great, and God bless them, but i got to be aware that they're doing that. Yeah. yeah. I know. When you think about someone selling Sex Pistols merchandise, you're yeah. just like, oh. yeah. Well, there's Sex Pistols slot <clears throat> Sorry. There's slot Sex machines. Pistols slot machines. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was first in the hard rock, you know, and there's a big sign, the only notes that really count are the ones that come in wall. Odds, and that's over the door of a casino that you're walking in. And then there's a Sid Vicious slot machine and you go, okay, okay. So this is, you know, satire's dead. We can no longer do satire. That's over. Well, it's hard to do satire you, today. It's done. Oh, I never today, liked it. But I today never liked it. It's really satire. hard yeah. because there's so many people that are serious that are more ridiculous than satire. Yeah. There's a guy who, I don't know his real name, but his, his Twitter name is Tatiana McGrath. Mm -hmm. 
and he plays like the most woke person in all of Twitter. And I retweet his stuff or her stuff, the the pseudonym, all the time, and people get furious. They're like, "Oh my god, is this fucking person serious? Like this is bullshit." And I'm like, "It's a parody." And they're like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and they go, "Okay, I get it." I'm like, "It's that close. It's that close to being oh, a real person." But not close. We've already crossed over. Oh yeah. You absolutely. There's no way to tell. No, there's, there's no, way, no to way to tell with woke people, with the with the woke young. There's today. no way to tell with with any with far right as well. Yeah. Anything, anything. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to tell with any of us. Things are so. But polarizing. I never, ever, ever liked satire. I never, ever liked parody. Even when I was reading the Onion, National Lampoon, the, the Onion. Uh, yeah, okay. Come Shut on, up. I'm the wrong. Onion. <laughs> How about that? Is that a turnaround fast enough for you? The Onion is too good. When the Onion did the headline when Steve Jobs died. Which said, a uh, nation uh, mourns the loss of the last person to do what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> 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 I, I went, okay, uh, that, that, that's perfect. Uh, but you know, I, I I saw that poster you have up. You have up here in your- uh, Which in one? Your, the Lenny Bruce Without Tears. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the idea of walking, I mean, and I, I looked, I was, I was whatever I was, uh, uh, 10 or 11 when Lenny Bruce died. And, um, but you know, I, I didn't ever hear him until after he was dead and you're younger than me. So even more so for you, but I, um, I did not go to college, but I, uh, I would hitchhike up to the college. that was nearby when I was in high school, which was UMass and all that Amherst, Amherst college. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, cause I'm from little dead factory town north of there. And, uh, I remember seeing, uh, Lenny Bruce without tears. They showed that as a film oh, wow. on the college campus. Um, wow. Uh, I think I'm remembering this right. Like we know our memories mm -hmm. are wrong, but I saw the film very early and it was uh, completely life changing for me. You know, um, the idea that stand up comedy was going to go from what to me was the Smothers Brothers uh, to, um, to somebody actually talking from their heart in a way that uh, made people laugh, but who cared? And of course, yeah. then Andy Kaufman turns that entirely inside out. But the idea that that form was created, you know, um, created here in the U.S. when you went from being a, a, a you know, a uh, Park Carcass, you know, Albert Brooks's father doing the Greek dialect and even throw in Amos and Andy and all of those people that did joke, joke, jokes and character stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, a guy coming out as himself and talking about his real life is just mind blowing to me. And so the idea that instead of doing parody, being able to get your laughs stating what you believe mm. and maybe that means people are laughing at you and maybe that's okay yeah it's it's definitely okay um but i don't think there's anything wrong with any way to do it i yeah. think there's nothing wrong with abbott and costello you know i mean it's <laughs> yeah i was having a talk with gilbert you know gilbert godfrey sure. and we were talking we said you know in in the um in laurel and hardy stan laurel was the brains and then the three stooges Mo was the brains, and in the Marx Brothers, Groucho was the brains, and Abbott and Costello had no brains. <laughs> you know that total. You want to talk about the Stooges being anarchy? Yeah. The the Abbott and Costello are just completely off the map. Yeah, but just really for the time though, it was groundbreaking. We yeah. had, it's hard for us to wrap our head around. As was Cheech and Chong. You know, Cheech and Chong for the time was groundbreaking. I know it has to do with drugs and yeah. For, you, well, that's for like, me, yeah. for me, I, I I was on a different team at that yeah. time. Yeah, but I've gone back, and that stuff is good. And of course, but I'm also a liar because I was crazy for Fire Sign Theater and mm. memorizing everything. And Phil Proctor is still a, a, a good friend of mine, and that was very much drug based. I think that comedy is like music in that there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. You know, and if you were a big fan of Bruce Springsteen and you went to see Bruce Springsteen but Run DMC showed up instead, you'd be furious. You'd be mm -hmm. like, what the fuck is this? But obviously, people love Run DMC. It's a different way to do a thing. It's a different way to express yourself. And 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 a way to learn. Yeah. You know, a way to learn when you get when you get pushed out of there. But it's it's just uh uh that that whole idea that you've got to um, decide. I mean, my life is so heavily affected 
by drugs, even though I had this whole, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to do any drugs. Why, you know. why did you have that decision? You know, I don't know. I don't know. That's always, uh, and I've talked about this on my, on my podcast forever. You know, I How tried to know. What's that? How old are you now? I'm 64 years old. And you have no experience with drugs other than None. medication, uh, me- medication when surgery. Sure. Right? sure. I mean, yes. And I have, I've had uh, deep enough uh, injuries that I have experienced. You just keep morphine. getting surgery because you love drugs. Yeah, exactly. Like, like excuse. <laughs> well, you know, uh, <laughs> Trey Parker um, said that my big flaw was never having been high. So, we can fix that. So I know. So I, <laughs> he did fix that. Did I went in for dental surgery. Uh, serious dental surgery, and they fucked up. And the uh, the dentist told the nurse what he had given me in terms of painkillers, and she took that as what she was supposed to give me. Oh. So instantly doubled the dose. And I was so fucking high and out of my mind. Dude, people can die that way. Yeah. And I told my wife, through my haze of not knowing who I was, call Trey Barker. <laughs> <laughs> Trey came to Vegas and said, I want to sit with Penn High. And so I go, he flew in immediately <laughs> while you were fucked up? Yeah. Oh, my God. How long did it take him to get to you? <laughs> we, 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 he, was, he was planning on being there. Like He came like a day early. Oh, okay. Uh, so he got, he got there like I was still high. And Trey said, I didn't remember anything. And Trey said the next day, I was right. You should be high. <laughs> well, there's different kinds of high, uh, yeah, just and, like there's different kinds of music. And you know, know I was very, I was very, uh, I was very close to Lou Reed, mm-hmm. and I was a very good friend of mine. And Lou said, speaking on behalf of the uh, people of Earth, which I often do, we don't want to see you high, motherfucker. Don't do it. So Lou says no. Trey says mm. yes. What does Joe say? Well, Joe, this is interesting because I wanted to talk to you about this because we had a conversation a long time ago about this. And you said, that I, and I'll, I'll remember this very clearly. I may paraphrase this, but you said, I think we've learned all there is to know and I don't need to do it. Uh, yes, I, I said that and yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, just wrong. I think you should experience psychedelics because you know, I think psychedelics uh, are a totally different thing. They don't take you Well, we out. know Sam Harris. Sure. Yeah, and Sam Harris is the one who got me meditating. Oh, awesome. Uh, which took him uh, years of arguing with me. And f- now it's been three or four years that I have not missed a day. Not missed a day. You uh, you have a problem. Here's one of your problems. You're very intelligent. You're also very large, and you're very <laughs> articulate, and people like to hear you talk. So you just can talk, and you can take over. You could overrun things, and you can make an argument that people just go, all right. <laughs> okay, and they step back, and that's good if you're trying to win an argument. But sometimes it's bad to take in ideas. And I remember when I had Perfect. that conversation. Exactly right. Thank you. When I had that conversation with you, I remember saying, "I'm going to revisit this someday, and one day I want to get Penn fucked up on mushrooms." Yeah. That's what I remember thinking. Like it might be a good thing for. Well, the best thing for you would be something that doesn't take very long. Just so you can exp- like DMT is the best one because it takes like 15 minutes and it's over, and then your body brings it back to baseline almost immediately so you literally travel to another dimension and then you're back and you don't have to worry about any overdosing because it's an endogenous chemical your body knows exactly what to do with it it's one of the quickest chemicals that your body can break down and bring back to baseline in in my defense uh from the very beginning of my not doing drugs um which is an odd odd kind of uh, kind of baseline there um I always left the a door open for um, for psychedelics in the heart. What I what I disliked the most was wine with dinner. Really, I disliked the most social kind of lubrication. Wine with dinner is amazing. I'm doing this in past tense. <laughs> you know, that's that's where I that's where I that's where I always was, and I always left open the possibility of some of the more intense stuff. Wine with dinner is a delicious drug. It's one of the rare delicious drugs. Like, I like whiskey, but let's be honest, it tastes like shit. It's weird. You're drinking this stuff, you're like, ah, woo! Like, it's got kind of a good flavor, but it's like, it's harsh. You can't drink it. Like, it can't fuck with Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid tastes way better than whiskey, (laughs) right? Kool-Aid's cheap. You just mix it up. It tastes delicious. It's way better tasting. But... You know, wine has a delicious taste that you can but enjoy. Here's my problem. One of my many problems. We'll detail more than one. Okay. But I have no skill at moderation. I'm 64 years old, and I've never been able to do 
anything with moderation. Mm. So I think if you told me we're going to do acid for the rest of our lives every single day, you could make that argument. The idea for me that's hard, like I said, when I said I was meditated, I haven't missed a day. Maybe you should microdose. Yeah, maybe. We'd give you a little right now, just a little spray. <laughs> you do microdosing sprays. Yeah, I I'll think I'll do it now. No. I want to think about it a little okay. bit before. Okay. It, although it would be pretty boss. <laughs> you tell me when. I'll no. open the box. You got the box right there. I got a box right here. Yeah. So um, how often do you so, – oh, I was going to answer that question. I have – a zillion answers to why I've never done drugs. Mm-hmm. And none of them are, of course, true because we don't have access to right. that stuff that we really do. But my parents and my whole family and back generations, teetotalers. So there was never alcohol in the house, mm. ever. I never saw my parents take a drink. Uh, when it was on TV, it was a totally different thing. It just didn't happen. I didn't. Have any, they never preached about it. They never said, don't drink. They never said, don't do drugs. It just never was in the house. And that statistically has a huge effect on people. And mm. then the first people I fell madly in love with, you know, uh, Lenny Bruce, Jimi Hendrix, um, had been, in my mind, killed by drugs. Mm. And I kind of said, ooh, people that have this kind of personality, when they get into drugs, they sometimes have trouble. And I think that maybe being 19 years old and trying to get into show business, that maybe being the sober one allowed the dumber guy to do a little better, you know? As everybody else kind of got out of my way, as they were fucked up some of the time, I could get other stuff done. And then that starts reinforcing. But that may no longer be valid. Well, there are drugs, I mean, I've never done coke. And one of the reasons why I never did coke, and I've talked about this many times, my friend growing up, his cousin used to sell it, and I watched his life fall apart. They were just doing coke all the time and lost a lot of weight and looked like a vampire. It was very strange. They just hung out in their uh, attic apartment. It was really weird. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, fuck Coke. It was like like a guy I know got bit by a monster, you know, and, and was infected with something. Yeah, the people the people that I've met on Coke, not pleasant. Not good. It's yeah. not I don't and, and I think that's also, you know, one of the accusations against Trump that he's on some sort of speed, you know, which is why he's so inexhaustible, you know, mm-hmm. and, and also why he has this uh, inability to be affected by criticism in terms of like he doesn't is no, no self-reflection. Shame. No shame. Right. No shame, no self-reflection. And that's something that is a symptom of people that are on speed. You know, and this mm-hmm. is the Adderall generation that we're living in. God damn, there's so many fucking people that are on Adderall. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's so goddamn common. You know, I was having this conversation um, the other day, and uh, someone was telling me about this guy that they know who's really brilliant, but... He won't stop. T- he's got ADHD and, you know, he just can't stop and he won't stop talking and this and that. And I'm waiting. I'm just waiting while this person's talking to me. I go, he's on Adderall. <laughs> and they go, yeah, he is. It's a medication. I go, no, 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 It's fucking speed. That guy's on speed, okay? And you can call it a medication because you can buy it at the pharmacy. But that fucking guy's on well, speed all day long, every day. And there is a giant number of people in this country that are medicated and that are on speed all the time. That's that great uh, Andy Warhol quote, which was in the 60s, we thought we were getting to know people, but we were getting to know drugs. Mm. Uh, you know, there's, there, there is definitely... There is definitely a personality type that we think is an individual that actually yeah. does seem to have a, a tie-in with. It's uh, fucking drugs. Adderall mindset. There's a speed mindset, and it's a go, 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 get everything done, more, bigger, faster, accumulate shit. I'm the fucking man. I'm the fucking man. Like that. That's a speed <laughs> mindset. It's a dangerous mindset. It's a real weird one, and it's not one that laughs at itself. It's not one that self-deprecates. It's all me, 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 me. I'm the shit. And that's what you get out of Trump. I mean, oh. this is, I mean, there's a guy who's an, a journalist who wrote a, a story about how he knows the very Dwayne Reed pharmacy in Manhattan where Trump was getting diet pills way back in the day where he was supposed to take it for like six weeks. He took it for years. And this guy is saying, like, this is what you're dealing with. Like, many people have called him the Adderall president. Like, this yeah. is entire, it, 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 it absolutely could be that he's on something. But it's that, that, all that we're talking about yeah. this whole time is just speed. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it gives him the energy to t- look. Remember when he was running for president? I'm like, how the fuck is this guy not tired? I get mm-hmm. tired if I tour and do stand up. When I do stand up, it's an hour. 
20 minutes of my own routine that I wrote myself. I'm hanging out with friends. I do two shows a night, and I'm like, woo, this motherfucker's touring, flying around in jets all over the country, just inexhausted, just no fucking script, just goes on stage in front of everybody, just ranting and raving about China and the economy and build the wall, and, well, all right, we're going to go to Ohio, and then off to the jet eating Kentucky Fried Chicken and fucking <laughs> flies into Ohio, and he does it again. I mean, who the fuck at 70 has that kind of energy? People on speed. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I might be wrong. Yeah. I might be wrong. But sure. it seems like it. It seems like all the pieces are in place. And there was a, a psychologist who did an analysis of all the various psychological um, traits that people who are on amphetamines have. And they compared it to Trump. And like all of them. Megalomania, all, all of the, the various mm -hmm. psychological characteristics, inability to accept criticism, you know, this thinking that everyone's against them, this, the, 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 this, this delusions of grandeur, all these different things. Well, was, there was a guy on, uh, on, uh, that was, was on Apprentice who talked about him, uh, who, him doing these, these kind of drugs. It was a news story. Mm. But it was, like a, it was like an intern that we weren't going to... Uh, just kind of faded away after mm. that, but I, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a nutty, uh, it's a nutty theory. Tom Arnold claims Donald Trump snorted Adderall on The Apprentice set. Okay, well, t I know Tom; he's crazy. <laughs> I love you, Tom, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe yeah. he did, but may Tom Arnold would say that he snorted Trump or snorted uh, Coke just to piss Trump off. Yeah, he would say that just because I'm fucking with him, I'm getting under his skin. You know? <laughs> maybe he did snort Adderall. I don't know. But, I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like he, that it's the kind of thing he would snort. It seemed like no. he would pretend take that it was medicinal. Yeah, yeah he'd take a pill. Yeah, I mean it's kind of medicinal. Here's the thing. It will allow you to get more things done. You know, we had a guy in here who wrote a book on Hunter Thompson. And uh, one of the things that he was talking about was that he needs Adderall to write. And I, I was going into it with him because one of the things, a dirty little secret about journalism is a tremendous amount of journalists are on Adderall. A tremendous mm -hmm. amount. Like an enormous amount. Like one of my friends who's uh, a pretty do legit... We do we know how much Adderall is going into the USA? That's a good question. How many Adderall prescriptions were made in 2018? Let's just find that out. Um, but my friend, who's a legit journalist for legit publications, said, you would be stunned. And he goes, he goes, it's an enormous percentage. Well, it's they the just vast started, majority. They just started banging it out. To, I mean, like they did with, um, with uh, fentanyl, the vets, to children. They just yeah. bang out Adderall under. And uh, what's the other one? Um, Prozac. No, the other one they do for, I guess, it, for it, for um, attention deficit. Deficit disorder. Yeah. Is another one other than Adderall? Is it all just Adderall? Maybe Prozac, just Adderall. I, I know Prozac. Prozac was, they put my neighbor's kid on Prozac. It was fucking horrific. Seems low. Uh, 16 million adults or prescriptions were filled. 16 million adults had prescriptions filled? Yeah. Mm, and that's 400,000 abuse it, which seems low also. So 16 million? Yeah. What is that, like 3%? Yeah. Yeah, that seems low. Less than four, four percent, something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't. Know. It seems very low. That was last year. It did. Twenty twelve was the last. Oh, most 2012. recent number I can find. I did no, no, twenty seventeen, no, no. but that's a million years ago, I know bro. It's not showing up. <laughs> Maybe uh, that was true recently. for twenty twelve. I think it probably was true for twenty twelve. I think we live in a whole new world now. And I, I don't think it's anywhere near four percent or five percent, whatever the fuck the real number is. I bet it's about ten. I bet it's ten percent of people in this country are on Adderall. If I had to guess, I bet it's around thirty million. I bet it's around yeah, there. I don't yeah, know. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. I know a bunch of people that are on it. A bunch, and you know, some people tell me they have to take it. That's what my favorite one is. I have to take it. I don't take it. What happens? You die. You disappear. <laughs> what happens if you don't take it? It's fucking speed, man. You know, like, and the, a lot of the people that take it, they're not healthy otherwise. Like, they're not exercising. They're not drinking a lot of water. They're not meditating. They're not eating healthy foods. Like, what do you, why do you need that? Like, what, what happens if you get rid of all that other stuff? Like, uh, cut out the shitty food, cut out all the sugar, start drinking water, no booze. Let's get you exercising three times a week. Let me see if you really need that Adderall shit. Yeah. Yeah. How many vitamins do you take? Do you take vitamins? Do you eat healthy? Are you drinking fruit juice and vegetable juice? Are you, are you What kind of nutrients are you taking into your system, man? And you're wondering why you don't have any fucking energy? So you're just pouring jet fuel into your <laughs> tank and lighting the whole fucking thing on fire. But on the other hand, it's like things get done. 
when you take speed. You know, what we were talking about Hitler the other day that um why wouldn't you be? Why wouldn't we be? We were talking about who was who were we talking about? Was it uh, with Fahim? I don't remember. Um but we were talking about how Hitler um, there was a, a time where Hitler had come back from something and he was supposed to meet Mussolini and he was like physically exhausted. So his doctor injected him with a combination of steroids and liquid cocaine. And he was just fucking filled with energy. He's like, give me another one. And the, the guy's like, no, I, I, I can't give you another one. He's like, fucking give me another one. And he gave him another one and then he went to Mussolini and ranted at Mussolini, just fucking talked at him for five hours. And Mussolini just never got a word in edgewise. And apparently Mussolini's plan Plan was to talk to Hitler and go, hey man, Italy wants to get the fuck out of this. We're not really interested in that. <laughs> and Hitler's like, what's that? And just fucking going crazy for five hours sweating like a pig because he was on fucking coke He was on coke and steroids. They just pumped him up with it. Maybe it's best to stay away from some drugs. Yes <laughs> Okay. Yes, but I mean it's it's amazing how much Productivity gets done because of caffeine, right? Now, what is caffeine? Caffeine is a very mild stimulant in terms of, you know, in compared to Adderall or things along mm -hmm. those lines. Yeah. But it is a fucking drug. And it's a drug. There's a goddamn drugstore on every corner. Everyone's buying it. It's in every gas station. Everyone's fueling up. You gotta fuel up yeah, early caffeine, morning. Caffeine, you know, I, I don't, I, I, well, no, I drink decaffeinated coffee, which means I drink 5%. Mm. Of what right? You know, I drink, I can drink eight cups of coffee, and it makes a. Do you just a, like the taste? Cup. I don't like the taste, but I like the social stuff. I like having a hot, bitter thing in front of me. Why don't you just have tea? I, I'd have tea too. Yeah, it's I, just a, like I, herbal. I, I nervously, green. I nervously drink. It's mm. a habit, like you know, like some people smoke. I like to have seltzer. I like to have uh, uh, decaf coffee or decaf tea or something like that. Yeah, I like seltzer too. It, it makes me feel like I'm doing something rather than drinking water. Mm -hmm. You know, like I like sparkling water. It's water with entertainment. Yeah, I like sparkling water with a little lime. Ooh, I got a drink here. I got a nice <laughs> little drink. Or you know what? You take decaffeinated espresso. And then you pour uh, carbonated water on top of that. And then you've got bitter, bubbly, you're drinking a potion. You want that. You want a potion. Mm, a potion makes you feel like an adult. Yeah, it makes you yeah. feel like a grown-up. This isn't yeah. Kool-Aid. This is an adult well, beverage. Exactly. And when you're, when you're a non-drinker of alcohol, yeah. you have to work very hard to look like you're drinking like an adult. Yeah, so you've never fucked with alcohol at all? No wine? Never. No nope. nothing? Nope. Nothing? I mean, tried it. okay, I, I know I'm talking to someone who pays attention. So... You can say that there is alcohol in vanilla, there's alcohol in things like that. So you can't say none, but none that I ever, active. I never, yeah. I never went to, uh, never went to, to, uh, searched out. It feels good sometimes. And never even accidentally. No one ever even, you know, fuck with me on that. Really? Well, that's good. That's, that's surprising. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. surprising given the circles you travel in. Yeah. I would imagine eventually someone, someone would be like, enough is enough. Get this, this guy fucked up. This would be funny. Yeah, this would be really <laughs> funny. Yeah. It seems like someone would have, that would have fit in someone's sense of humor. Some great oh, word. Who knows? This may be the day. No, yeah. I I'm wouldn't do that your water. <laughs> if you. If you really want to say the word, we'll open up the box of doom. The box of doom. Yeah. How often do you do uh, psychedelics? Drug? Yeah, psychedelics. It, not that often. A couple times a year. Oh, like, really? Get, like, I mean, we did mushrooms on a podcast a couple months ago, but that was a small dose. But uh, the tank is my friend. The you know, I tried that. Let's talk tank. about this. Extra, Please. Century tank. I have one right here. Uh, yeah. I have one your size. You I went, get in yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to one of these places where you pay them X amount of money and you go mm -hmm. in. Because my buddy, Tim Jennison, we did a movie called Tim's Vermeer, where he painted a Vermeer in his garage. And uh, Tim was really into that. I'll do anything Tim does. I just I just loved him. And uh, so I went and, you know, whatever you pay, a few bucks, and you, you go in and float in the tank. And I was so ready. I have a, this happens so much in my life. I get so ready for a major change in my life. The first time I wanted to become a vegan, I went out with a friend. This was like in 1990. And it was a guy I was making fun of brutally, ripping him the fuck apart for his stupid eating, you know? And I said, listen, I want to go out with you to a restaurant, just eat vegetables, and I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm not going to make fun of you. You talk to me for three hours about all your Peter Singer stuff, all your ethical vegetarian stuff, and you convert me. That's all I want you to do. Oh. That was the reason I went out. That was the reason I went out with him. And I finished up the whole evening and I went, you know, I really respected your point of view until I understood it. <laughs> <laughs> and motherfucker talked me out ah! of doing what I wanted to do. Uh. And... So I got ready, man, with the with 
with the uh, isolation tank. I said, this will be good. He's talking about this. I'm just going to go there, sensory deprivation. I'll just let my mind wander. Mm-hmm. And I went in there, and it was just salty, and I was bumping against walls. Yeah. Yeah, you, it's, you need to get used to it. It's like mm-hmm. the meditation. Try meditating once. You're like, I couldn't concentrate. Yeah, meditating once is useless. Yes. Yeah. It's... Um, you, How often do you do the tank? All the time. I used to have one in my house. Well, you're house. not in it now. No. <laughs> not all times, but often, I should okay. say. Um, I used to have one in my house, and now I just have it here. But it's a very valuable tool. And you me. meditate as well. Yeah. I meditate. I like to meditate before shows. I've been doing a lot more lately. Um, uh, but the tank is a great place to meditate as well because it's meditation squared. It's meditation without any external stimulation. So mm-hmm. I can climb in there and the, and do uh, you follow, do you follow breathing rules and yeah. stuff you would do on normal? What kind of meditation do you do when you meditate? Uh, and do you do it what I've day? been doing, what I've been doing lately is all I do is concentrate on my breath. Other things get in there, but I just say, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe mm-hmm. in, breathe out and I just concentrate on long slow rhythmic breaths and I get myself into this weird state and you know this will come in oh you got a fucking low front tire you gotta you gotta get that filled oh this is you need this the your inspection sticker and uh and the bullshit comes in but I just breathe in breathe out force it out force Mm -hmm. it out and after five or ten minutes of this I can get to a nice state where I can just keep doing it keep doing it but in the tank it's very accentuated because in the tank I don't have to think about my butt in the seat, my hands on the table. I don't have to think about anything else. Just I'm just lying there. What you're experiencing when you're talking about bumping into the walls, that's just a technique thing. When you when you lie in it, right, you get into the tank. First of all, you need a big tank. You're a giant yeah. guy. Um, there's a lot of those little pods. Those are, those are barely big enough for me. You know, it's for a guy like you. You need a large one. And you lie down in the tank, and then you put your hand on one wall and your hand on the other wall, and you let the water still. Because there's going to be a lot of little ripples when you're floating because you're so buoyant. There's a thousand pounds of Epsom salts in there and you're floating. And it's easy to just kind of bounce back and forth. So you put your hands there till they steady. And then once the ripples kind of stop, then you slowly bring your hands down. And then when you slowly bring your hands down, you do it really slow so you're not making any ripples. And then lay there. And then you could be in the exact same position for hours. And that's, that's how – it's a technique. You just you have to center yourself. How long do you do? Is there two hours is what I like. I'll two do an, hours. I'll do an hour if I'm in a rush, and I have um, a uh, although rushing for it is. Yeah, I mean it's not a rush. Yeah. It's just an hour. <laughs> but I, if I can't spend any more time than an hour, but I have a tape recorder that's voice activated and it's Velcro, and so I can stick it up inside the thing. So if I have an idea, which I do sometimes, sometimes I have this temptation. Fuck, I got to get out of here. I got to write this down. I can just say it, and the the tape recorder will pick it up. Have there been brilliant stuff you said? No, nothing. I've never used it once, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't gotten out of the tank and had satisfaction. No, there's you know that Keith Richards yeah, thing, right? Da, da, no, but he went to sleep. Really? He had this uh, uh, sound activated recorder that he got by the side of the bed, Whoa. and uh, and his guitar, and he went to sleep one night. Woke up the next morning there on the tape recorder. Oh. Uh, there was some voice activation in the night. He played it. It was satisfaction. My friend you works. You haven't gotten that yet? No, I haven't had that yet. My friend works at a school in Connecticut where his kids go, where Keith Richards' kids go. Mm-hmm. And Keith Richards will ride on a bike to school with a fucking bandana on. And like my friend's like, holy shit, that's Keith Richards. Like He's just kind of <laughs> hanging around with normal people. And he said it freaks you out. When you see him, you're like, what? That's fucking Keith Richards? He just hangs out. Just like... You know, he's yeah. a giant superstar, but he drifts into the real world and it just freaks people out. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, I only met Keith Richards in groups of people. I mean, that were, wasn't really like bicycling into your, yeah. but still it's so, it's so amazing. It's surreal. So right? surreal. So he's surreal. an epic human. Yeah. Yes. The voice recorder thing is new. That's why I haven't had any, uh, new, it's a new idea that I have because there's times that I did. But the have solution to, get out. to yeah. this, Team thing and the uh, and the separation of America and getting more polarized. That's going to be solved by Joe in the tank at some point. We can count on that. No. Now that you got the recording, I think we're going to solve it ourselves. I think we're going to solve it ourselves through just time. I, I think as we're getting back to Pinker, we we're talking about Pinker earlier that he gets so much shit for saying that things are better now than ever. 
it doesn't dismiss horrific acts that take no. place or terrible things. And that it are doesn't going say on. that the battle is over. Right. No. no I no. mean, yeah. this is one of the things that um, I would push in, in my little microcosm, push for so hard in Penn and Teller. You know, uh, Teller and I would have real trouble just crossing a finish line. I would just say to him, you know, Teller, we, we've, we've done five seasons of bullshit and it went well. Let's go out, the two of us, have coffee and donuts, and let's just say, wow, we did that. And then push ahead for the next thing. And I would just, uh, I just think that Pinker is like that with me. Pinker's like saying, you know, human beings, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. We've done some really good things. Now let's get back to work. We're most certainly doing better than ever before, and I think that's an accumulative thing. It's like if as time we don't goes blow on, everything yes. to pink kingdom come, which and could. if we don't destroy the environment, yeah. If those two things, which the two enormous ifs, yeah. we're in very good shape. They the, are the thing ifs. that blew my mind about Pinker in that in that book, Better Angels, blew my mind is uh, there's this line that's that, that that's been obsessing me uh, with uh, a cracker in Teen Angst. I don't know what the world may need, but I sure as hell know it starts with me, and that's a wisdom I've laughed at. Mm. All this shit that I've laughed at that turns out to be true for me now, it just makes me smile and fills me with joy. You know, uh, early part of the 20th century, all these authors and artists and all these guys were saying, Hemingway and stuff, we're going to stop war. By writing about war and writing about how bad it was, and we're going to give empathy for other people, and we'll understand this, and we're going to really, with our art, make an effort to make humanity better. What a jack-off bullshit thing to do. <laughs> I mean, there's no, can you imagine something more that's just twiddling your dick than saying that, oh, I'm going to do art, I'm going to write, and it's going to change the world. My poetry. And then Pinker's book says, why is all this stuff getting better so fast? We think it may be art, <laughs> and it may be empathy. And it mm. turns out that uh, all this stuff people were saying about, you know, we can change, we can change how people see yeah. warfare and how people see one another. And that's what scares me so much about um, how some people speak of, and I think it's because I don't understand it. Usually when I'm against something, it means I don't understand it. But when they talk about cultural appropriation, Cultural appropriation seems to me to be the greatest thing you can possibly do. To see the world through the eyes of someone who grew up differently than you. To even try to do that. For even for us to pretend right now to be a, uh, uh, you know, a white nationalist. Even trying to do that seems like it's a really good thing for us. To try pretend? And, just to get just, into their head? Just to try to fantasize what it's like to be, for instance, a uh, uh, African-American transgender man. If we try to do that, we're writing a piece of art and we try to see ourselves from that point of view. Mm. I'm not, not, not ourselves. See the world from that point of view. That seems like nothing but healthy. It seems like that takes you out of your identification. Well, I think there's a lot of what we're calling cultural appropriation that is really people trying to tell other people what to do. Because mm -hmm. people enjoy telling people they can't do that anymore and getting angry at those people. They mm -hmm. enjoy it. They enjoy pushing buttons. People, you give them a rock and a window, they want to throw that rock through the window. <laughs> this is a natural part of yeah. being a person. Yeah. And if you see a girl with hoop earrings, like, bitch, take those earrings off. Those are for Latinos, or those are for this, or those are for yeah. that. I mean, it, and the argument is so often not even based historically, like the earring thing. Like, fuck, man, what are you, from Sumer? Like, that's the oldest known hoop earring. Like, are, are, you, <laughs> well, that's are, are also, you from Babylon? It's also what, uh, I don't know if this is, this is not Pinker, this is Noah um, Harari, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who talks about, when you're talking about cultural stuff, how far back you're going. Right. I mean, there are no tomatoes in Italy. Right. You know, sure. It, yeah. Tomatoes right. are not indigenous to Italy. Pasta right? came from China. Yeah. And potatoes aren't from Ireland. They, they don't start there, you know? So you have to keep going back. There was a great, you know, uh, Paul Simon got so much shit for Graceland, uh, you know? And, uh, and, and David Byrne gets so much shit for stuff. And there's this wonderful thing in, in David Byrne's uh, book, How Music Works, which is a fabulous book. But he doesn't ever address this 
picking things from other cultures ever. But he talks very strongly about the African kinds of music and the influences they have from other places. You know, because there is not, there is not a culture other than the whole world, especially not now. Yeah. You might be able to have made the argument 200 years ago that but there were pat- The thing pat- is, though, that people enjoy cultures. So if that is the case and everything does assimilate and becomes one big gray mass, we're worried that we're going to lose Indian food, right? We're, we're worried that we're going to lose I have certain- no worry of that at all. No? I have no worry because I think that me loving Sun Ra, even though... Uh, I'm not African-American, and me loving Lenny Bruce, even though I'm not urban and identify as Jewish, I think that loving these kind of cultures should not be based on an accident of birth. The loving thing is one thing. The, I think the real fear of cultural appropriation is that people will take on those things as their own. Like, There's a gentleman, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, he's a famous... Mexican chef, but he's not Mexican, but he mm-hmm. cooks Mexican food. He cooks it in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Walt Bayless, is that his name? Um, something Bayless? Rick Bayless. Rick Bayless. He, this guy has an undeniable passion for Mexican cuisine. I mean, mm-hmm. he fucking loves it. He has uh, a couple different restaurants where he cooks Mexican food, and he was getting protested, and people were furious at him. Um, because they had just decided at one point if this guy's had like, you know, a 30 fucking year career of being in love with Mexican cuisine and being like a real uh, historian of Mexican cuisine, like where it comes from, the regions, the ingredients, like where's the best ingredients, where's the best places to cook these things, how they do it, why they did it this way. And I mean, speaks with incredible passion about this. They were deciding that he's a white guy. And he shouldn't, he shouldn't be able to do this, shouldn't be able to sell this, shouldn't be able to... Like, you fucking assholes, like, this is the guy. Right. He's helping yeah. everyone recognize the beauty of this much maligned food. When, you, when people think about Mexican cuisine, he is one of the rare people in Western culture that talks about it like it's five-star cuisine. So many people talk about, oh, I love street tacos and fucking I'm yeah. a, a big fan of quesadillas. No, this guy's talking about the very best Mexican cuisine in the world and trying to interpret that and sell it to people and trying to turn people on to how good this food is and, and yet he was taking so much shit when a person that wasn't born in that ac- the accident of birth to be yes. there falls in love with another culture i don't see why that isn't more beautiful yes yeah that's 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 what i'm looking for well that's steven seagal yeah he moved to japan and became <laughs> a, a master before he became kind of silly he was one of the very first guys to ever teach aikido in a dojo in japan that wasn't japanese I think he actually was the first. I think he was the first American to ever run a dojo in Japan. So now, okay, getting me on psychedelics is very easy compared to getting me to really dig Steven Seagal. <laughs> you don't have to dig it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure I do, although I do, I do appreciate his first movie, Above the Law. I appreciate uh, what he... Th- Look, he likes his prepositions. He's a silly fella. A sil- <laughs> silly fella, for sure. It is but m- many of us are. Sure. But what he, he did do is he learned Aikido at a very, very high level, like undeniably. And he was teaching it in Japan. He spoke perfect Japanese and he was a very rare guy, you know? Now, you know, he became a Hollywood guy in movies and who knows what the fuck else and became enormous, you know, physically. He got fat Mm -hmm. and, you know, he's kind of silly now. Mm -hmm. But at one point in time, that guy was as legit as it gets. Isn't that always true? Yeah. You know know what I want to, I'm going to completely change the subject if I may. Sure. You know, I want to talk about when you came on my radio show with Phil Plate about the moon landing. Oh, talked about the moon landing, yeah. Yeah. But what what I think is fascinating about this, about clubs and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. is uh, I, uh, you know, and I, I, I know I've, I've, I've read here and there that you, uh, you you've, uh, you, you've gone back on a lot of that and your conspiracy stuff and so. Yeah, on. but that's that's not that's. But not- I can explain that too. I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, this is this is the thing. I, I have zero astrophysics mm-hmm. education. Zero. I don't know anything about p- whether or not th- it's possible to put people on the moon. I do know fuckery. And I, I do know teams, and I do, I do, I do understand when people are bullshitting people. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of that with, with a lot of the NASA stuff, a lot of the older stuff in particular. There was a lot of manipulation of images and putting things online that may not have actually really happened because it was press releases. And mm-hmm. there's an image of Michael Collins from like uh, Gemini 15 that's a, uh, a very clear um, 
image of him uh, doing a simulation, like in a studio with straps and harnesses, and then someone from NASA or someone put that exact same in image, blacked out the background, and used it as a photo of a, of a spacewalk. Mm -hmm. And it's not real, you know, but they sold it as real. There was some overzealous shit sure. like that, that if you're conspiratorially minded, you might say, ah. Once, once you start lying, Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the Area 51 and stuff. Yes. You know, we know they lied. Yes. Like motherfuckers. Yeah. And that's the problem. But what I just wanted to compliment you, and I just also think this is really interesting, you know. So Joe Rogan believes this crazy shit we didn't go to the moon. I know Joe Rogan. We're on a, we're on a radio show together. Da, 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 da. He's a good guy. We did Fear Factor. But he believes this shit. Let's, let's have him talk to someone who's real. So I call Phil Plate, who I don't know that well, right? But he's the bad astronomer and he knows this shit. And I say, uh, I really want you to come on my radio show and just talk to Joe Rogan about, uh, about um, the moon landing. Moon landing. And uh, Phil says, oh, no problem. We'll just go on there. We'll, we'll set him straight. And I go, I, I, I just want to warn you, uh, have your ducks in a row because Joe's really good. And he goes, well, Joe's, Joe's a comic, right? I, 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 yeah. And that's your problem because Joe's better at talking than you. Joe knows when the commercials are coming. <laughs> Joe knows how to make a joke. And Joe knows also how to set you up and take you down. He, oh, no, no, no. It'll be no problem. I said, you understand that he's smart. He's a comic, right? Yeah. Not an astrophysicist, but you understand that he's smart and he's also... You are going into his form. We're going to be on radio. This guy has done a lot of radio. This guy's talked to a lot of people. So just have all your facts in line. And then we're sitting there because, you know, you were you were on the phone. And uh, Godot, my, my, uh, who's on my podcast with me too, sitting across from me, and we're listening. And you come in, and you come in humble and charming and sexy and with Perfect timing on everything. And Phil Play starts going, I'm, 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 I go, oh, man, Joe is wrong, and Joe is going to fucking win. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I set this up. So that, um, so that uh, it will be a fa it'd be fair. My whole thing of doing this, the way I billboarded it, was I'm just going to have two guys talk from two points of view. I'm not supposed to commit. That. I don't know if you remember, but the whole show ends, and I go, "Oh, by the way, we did land on the moon." <laughs> And just trying to do this final authority thing. And Phil said afterwards, well, he, he had a lot. I said, yes, yeah. And it's just that idea that you can't, you know, his idea was there's the science team that's right. Yeah. And then there's this goofy comic. And trying to get Phil Play to understand that a goofy comic was not a goofy comic. And I believe that the only thing that the SATs truly test is how good you will be as a comedian. <laughs> that kind of verbal, it was a wonderful thing to listen to. It was wonderful to listen to someone who I believe absolutely was 100% wrong, yeah. who was just so skilled and so moral and so thoughtful and so humble. You had everything going for you that I respect, except you didn't happen to be right. Well, we don't know what happened. We assume that what we see is what happened. We assume that what the scientists tell us was ha was what happened. We assume that what NASA mm -hmm. told us was what happened. When you say, I know this happened, right. you're not always correct. Exactly. You're oftentimes correct. I know Kennedy got assassinated in Dallas. I've seen the video. I know he got assassinated mm -hmm. in Dallas. I don't know if Lee Harvey Oswald did it. I don't know. I assume he was involved. It seems like he was. Yeah. Was there other people involved too? I assume there were, and one of the reasons why I assume there were is the magic bullet, the fucking the guy who got hit with the ricochet under the overpass. But I do want the, you to know that I made the shot with the man like Kirk Kakana. Oh yeah, it could be made. Yeah. Oh, that's horseshit. Listen, I've talked about that in 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 length. And it's also, the head yards. goes towards that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things. Um, there's there's a lot of things we could you know go over the Kennedy assassination. There's a lot of things. I'm not on one wait school a minute, wait or a minute, another. Wait a minute. Are we gonna? Are we going to solve the polarization in America, or are the we going to solve landing? the Kennedy assassination, or are we going to solve the moon landing? All of them. Or you want to do all of them? 
Yeah. Okay. I just want to know what our goals were. The moon landing is a conspiracy theories dream, a conspiracy theorist dream, because it's got everything in place. It's got this incredible technological achievement. It's got these three guys that look incredibly nervous at the post landing press conference, and they they look all sketched out. It's got these guys that don't do interviews afterwards. It's got no one ever lands on the moon again after 1973 or whatever it was. It's got all these technological achievements, but we never get outside of Earth's atmosphere again. We're always inside of Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. There's so many beautiful things that conspiracy theorists can grasp a hold of and go, and the, see, it's bullshit, but it doesn't and the mean distance. it. But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. There's the Van Allen radiation belts. There's that we never even sent a chicken into deep space and had to come back alive. There's mm -hmm. all these things. But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. And the, my problem was, and this is, you know, and people said, oh, you know, you've sold out. You're a shill now. And like, no, no, no. I'm just being honest now. Whereas before, I wasn't being honest with myself and I wasn't being honest about the subject. I do not know whether or not people went to the moon. I was pretending that I knew that people didn't go to the moon. And I was arguing it that way. Mm -hmm. I was on a team. I yeah. was on team. It's bullshit. We didn't go to the moon. And... You, you you really can't do that accurately. It can't be done. You, you can say, this is what's interesting. Mm -hmm. This is what I find curious. This is what's weird. In fact, there's not a single technological achievement from 1969 that's not cheaper, easier, and faster to reproduce today, except going to the moon. Like, mm -hmm. it's one of the rare things in life. Still doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. Like, Occam's razor is a slippery thing because there's weird shit that happens. And yeah. you got to take that into account. Like, there's no absolutes. There's not one thing that you can say, well, there is a rule, and this rule must be followed, and here's that rule. It doesn't work yeah. that way. The world is made of weird stuff. And I'm also... The, the, the idea, there's, there's a thing that's changed. There was an article in the Times about this, and you might have even been mentioned in it. Um, there's a, uh, a playful space of conspiracy theories mm -hmm. that it's taken me a long time to understand. My daughter is 14, and she talks about, you know, her, her father did a show called Bullshit, <laughs> And she talks about how she loves conspiracy theories. And this is from Paul McCartney's Dead to We Didn't Land on the Moon to all those things. But she sees it, which is so hard for me to understand. She sees it as not impacting reality, but as a playful inter intellectual exercise. I don't know what's going on, but there was this wonderful article in the Times, and you were mentioned there too, but there's also another guy who does it who will do this, uh, to use a cliche, I can't think of a better one, go, going down the rabbit hole mm. of conspiracy stuff, playing around with the logic that almost feels like a mathematical thing or a pure philosophical thing or a, or a angels dancing on the head of a pin thing. And uh, there's a quality that you have learned um, that my daughter has learned indirectly, I think, from you um, through other people doing this, of there is a playful space where we discuss how we, uh, how we share our reality that is happening in the conspiracy theory art form. Mm. And the conspiracy theory art form is now seeming to me to be more like rap or rock and roll, or it's, it's just a form. <laughs> a thing. Where you play around with this kind of thing. And I am so um, literal minded. I'm so verbal minded. You know, f Bob Dylan's easy for me. The Stones are hard. You know, Zappa's easy. 20th century classical's easy, but just funk is hard for me. And it's the same kind of thing here. It's really easy for me to say we are doing um, uh, the old-fashioned scientific inquiry and this is the yes. way falsifiable. But there is something happening in our thinking that's really interesting that I had to have my daughter explain to me and the New York Times after I already knew you and watched you do it. Well, you've always, you've always been a champion of science and reason, right? And conspiracy theories, for the most part, fly in the face of science and reason. And it, it, you don't want to be a buffoon. No but, there's one wants a to be a fool. but there's a yes, poetic thing there happening. Is, but it's tricky. 
and you don't people don't want to be a fool well i'm a professional fool mm -hmm. i don't mind being a fool and mm -hmm. you know being self-deprecating and being a, a moron is part of being a comic it's fun the the co conspiracy theory world went south for me when i did a television show about right it. i did that joe rogan questions everything show mm -hmm. and i spent six seven months doing this show and at the end of it i was like okay i get it this is a bunch of unfuckable white guys <laughs> <laughs> that's what it really is. Yeah. That's what I decided. I said, you, you know, I had a bit about it. I said, you want the one thing you don't find when you go looking for Bigfoot? Black people. <laughs> You're more likely to find Bigfoot than you are black guys looking for Bigfoot. Yeah. It is a bunch of unfuckable white dudes out camping and listen to what? Did you hear that? What is that? You know, it's like it's nonsense. Like you're you're wrapped up in this idea that there's a mystery and there's a something, there's a thing, a quality about human beings where we want to uncover secrets. We want to be the person that finds out the truth because then your miserable, shitty fucking life now doesn't matter. The fucking aliens are real, man. They're here. And aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. you know, the the mo one of the best feelings we can get, probably better than coming, is that feeling of aha. Uh -huh. I understand. I've gotten mm. a revelation. And we see this all the time. Detective shows, you know, Sherlock Holmes, you know, nothing to do with police work. Yeah. But there is a feeling that wouldn't it be nice if in this hour I were able to figure something out? Yes. Because if you want to understand string theory, you're not going to do it an hour. You're not going to do it ever. <laughs> exactly. I don't think those guys understand it even if they teach Precisely. it. Precisely. <laughs> well, let's take an easier one. <laughs> let's take a candle flame. You're okay. never going to understand that. Right. Uh, studying that forever. And there's, there's an area where conspiracy theories are exercising the muscles of logic, exercising the muscles of skepticism, playing around with the, with the haiku of if- then, if, then, playing around with um, what we feel about the government and other people and stuff like that. And you're playing around with all of that in kind of a semi-safe zone. And even watching you just do it here, where you, where, you, where you bang out that stuff and say, this is the stuff I question, what's coming out of that poetically uh, and let's not, let's not even talk about whether we went to the moon or not. What's coming out of your style of inquiry on that kind of thing, your style of skepticism, is just fascinating and beautiful. And I see the conspiracy thing as not so much a breaking down, which I used to see it as, a breaking down of science and reason, but I see it as rather a, a creation of a new form of poetry. That's weird. I don't know. If my I agree daughter with you. just said. My daughter just says, you know, mm. I really like conspiracy theories, and I say to her, you know, Paul McCartney is still alive, right? But you know, she's fourteen, and you're Penn Gillette, so she's rebelling. <laughs> you understand that, right? You're a parent. You know what it's like. You may have just told me something really important yeah. that I was too dirt That's dumb the to whole realize. Thing. Here's the thing: it's that, like Neil Gaiman's daughter coming in um, all gothed out, yes. and Neil saying to her, "I invented this. You can't do this. <laughs> this is not the way you can rebel. You can't rebel against me like this. You can't do it with uh, black hair and eyeshadow. You can't do it." Uh, <laughs> but you, yeah, yeah. Well, kids, you know, they they find their own way, and they they want to express themselves you know mm -hmm. they want to exert power over their world but did you see that article that you were mentioning no i did not yeah, it was it was i, I try not to read anything that i mentioned it. I, me I, too I, I briefly do oftentimes and i'm like ah. i try to never read anything <sighs> with my name in it yeah. because it's not written for us right and exactly. I'll, I'll tell you the exact moment that happened to me that was so great uh it was in the 80s we were on broadway and uh, uh, I, the Coen brothers were just starting to do movies, you know, and I was really interested in them, you know. And uh, I, had, I had like an hour free, which when I was doing Stern and Letterman and Saturday Night Live and on Broadway, I never had an hour free. And I was a magazine, like Vanity Fair or something, who cares what the fuck what it was. And it said what the Coen brothers are really like, what it's like to work with the Coen brothers, mm. okay. And I said, I never read magazine, I'm going to buy this, I'll learn a little bit about the Coen brothers. I went up to our office, you know, it's like the Brill building, you know, uh, Lauren Michaels and sit in my office, open it up, what the Cone Brothers like, turn to that page. I said, if you want to know what the Cone Brothers are like, it's like hanging out with Penn and Teller. And I went, 
What? 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 How is that even real? I closed the magazine, put it aside, and they were going on comparing it. And I went, I have no information on this. None. There's no way I can access it. And in that moment, I went, oh, wait a minute. When it says Penn Jillette in an article or in a book, there's no way I can understand that. Maybe others can. Right. You know, so when it says in the article, um, you know, when Joe Rogan does conspiracy stuff, da, 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 you can't understand that. It's no. like Mike Nesmith said to me, the major problem with talking to Jimi Hendrix was he never heard Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> you never saw right. Jimi Hendrix on stage. He couldn't. Right. And, you know, so you are the one person that using Joe Rogan as an example, you know, well, you know, kind of a proletariat, kind of a, kind of a, he does this bro culture. This is Joe. You can't understand that. No. You have no idea what that means because you're an individual. Well, it's also people are trying to encapsulate you by sure. those brief moments. They might have seen a video or heard you talk but about But it means this something or, to other people. Sure. It means know? something. It and means- it also, it, it, you can easily categorize someone and put them in this box. And now I've, I've defined that. Oh, I know what that is. But I've that's seen also, one of those before. That's it's also, like hanging out with Penn Gillette. Yeah. There it's it also is. part of your job. Yeah. Part of your job, one of the things you've created is you've created something in the culture that means the New York Times can say, Joe Rogan. And their people reading that know what that means. Mm, but there's no yeah. way Joe Rogan can know what that no, means. No, you can pretend. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or you could be like Trump and get mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know where the rubber hits the road with conspiracy theories right now? Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, yeah. That's where the rubber hits the road. Now, That's where it, people that are not conspiratorial minded were, are like, what, wait, what the fuck is going on? Mm-hmm. What? All the cameras were bad. Oh, the guy was on suicide watch. He tried to commit suicide. And then they're mm. like, well, don't do that again. And then he did it. Like, if you talk to people that have been locked up, they take away everything, man. Mm-hmm. If you, you, you've been on Suicide Watch, they fucking take away everything. Mm-hmm. And you find this guy, he's got a broken neck, and he hung himself. Like, how? How did he hang himself? Can we see the video footage? Oh, sorry, the cameras are broken. I think hanging oh. yourself is wicked hard. It's not easy. Oh, yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy when you're in a jail, and they take oh, away have all you, your have shit. You been, have you been to jail? No. No, no, never been in jail. I was only in jail overnight, but I mean, they, if you're on suicide watch, man, they make it hard for you to kill yourself. And they watch you, <laughs> that, and if you're, is the, that what suicide watch means? Yes, they okay, watch good, you. Thank you. They watch you so you can't kill yourself again. That's the. But idea. they watch you every thirty minutes or something. Who, who, what the fuck was the psychologist thinking that took this guy off suicide watch literally a couple of weeks after he tried to commit suicide? If someone tries to commit suicide, you know, and I, speaking as who's a guy who's had friends commit suicide. They're fucking thinking about it for years, man. Some of them, they go back and forth day to day. Some of them. Some Some of them them just do. Yes. Some of them just do that. But when someone does actively try it, they're not going to just be fine while they're in fucking prison awaiting trial for having sex with kids. It seems like Jeffrey Epstein's life was going to get really worse from what it was a few months before. Could be, or other people's lives are going to get really worse yeah. because Jeffrey Epstein's now in jail and they're digging deep into his past. And, well, I only flew with him 26 times. 26 <laughs> times, it ain't a lot of times to fly with a guy. I don't understand what the big deal is. <laughs> we flew in a jet. We rode a bus together. Uh, he was on the back but of my bike. Do you know Do you know people that know Jeffrey Epstein? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Me too. And a lot of them, uh, it really was that. Uh, yeah. talk, talk to him. Well, hung out a little bit. There's many people that feel like he was an agent uh, and that he was trying to compromise people. And that's one of the things about this whole Lolita Island thing is that they would compromise people. They would compromise people by having a bunch of young girls who are very sexy, who were hired to go and flirt and maybe even have sex with people, and that these people were young. Uh, these girls were like 17, underage, perhaps underage some places, perhaps not underage other places, but in- incredibly embarrassing and you know, for for the people, an that agent compromise for whom? Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of thoughts, but that's one of the things about when he got arrested. The the was it the prosecutor, or whoever it was, that cut him the deal. Literally was quoted as saying, "I was told he's above my pay grade, yeah, and that he was intelligence." That's the quote. Really, the intelligence yes. thing. Try to find that quote. Yeah, try to find that quote. Yes. The guy said this was when he gave him a lenient sentence many years ago. Was well, it 2012 or something? No one seems to know how he uh, made got his, his money. money. Yeah. Well, the fucking $70 million penthouse that he had in Manhattan was given to him. Right. 
given to him. Yeah. Who the fuck gives someone a $70 million house? Well, I was kind of hoping you would to me. I don't have one. Okay. If I have a bunch of them, I'll give you one. I got to run. You got to go now? <laughs> no, I'm just no. joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was here to get a $70 million house. Oh, you were told wrong. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy, it's, it, I think there, look, I've talked to people many times that work for intelligence agencies. And there's a lot of weird shit that they do. And one of the things that they do to compromise people is they get them involved in weird stuff that could be very bad for them if yeah. it comes out. And then they have influence over this person. And if you got a guy with a voracious sexual appetite, I mean, there's a few of those fellas out there. And, you know, hey, man. You're very I'm proud out, of that, aren't you? <laughs> I'm out of office now. I'm just fucking hanging out, having a good time with Jeffrey. And we're just flying around. I mean, come on, man. It's 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 highly likely. One of the guys that I know that knew him was also a freak, like a sexual freak. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I think I think I see a pattern here. This the, it's very likely that that's what was going on. This guy was compromising people and probably absolutely a sex addict himself. And I believe all the women that say all the horrible things that he did to them and hired them for things and had underage girls do sexual things with him. It's probably true. It's probably true. He's probably a fucked up, twisted dude. But many people that are involved, even in good things, get compromised. Like, there's many people that work for the CIA that were legitimate CIA operatives who wound up selling drugs. This, this, a lot of this happens. People go sideways. People get in, involved in shady activity that are cops. There's cops that wind up doing illegal things. They, they signed on to be a cop, to be a, a, a person who's going to serve and protect and be involved in the community. And slowly but surely, they get compromised and they get involved in illegal activity. Activity, and the next thing you know, they're corrupt. It happens. It yeah, happens it does. to people. Certainly, it certainly happens. And then sometimes people fucking suicide themselves. No and the deal. people that uh, that I know that knew him, it was uh, they weren't even aware of the CD stuff mm -hmm. going on. So, uh, and of course, that's going to be true too. Well, he was not going to be a hundred percent. He was also a champion of science. Yeah, I mean, big the, champion yeah, of science. And he, but that's the thing about people; they can be really good sure. in some ways and horrible in other ways. This idea that people are binary or one or a zero is nonsense. Yeah. There's really good people that do terrible things. There's really terrible people that also do good things. You know, like, look, fucking Trump just passed something and no one wants to give the, him credit for this. kidney stuff. What's the kidney stuff? Uh, he, he did. He did wonderful stuff for kidney transplant stuff. I'm sure he did. Pushed through. Well, he I was going to say that he uh, absolved all the student loans for disabled veterans. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I love it. You don't hear a word about it. A word of praise. Look, we should absolve student loans for fucking everyone. We're crippling kids. We're crippling uh, the 17, 18 year old kids who sign up for these fucking loans and they get compromised to the point where we have people to this day right now that are getting their social security money. Their social security money is getting docked because they owe student loans. They're at the end of the fucking road. But what do you do? What do you do? Uh, and this is a real question. This is not rhetorical. What do you do about the feeling of fairness? The people that work their way through college waiting tables. That's a good question. Working really hard. And then they, uh, do we just say their feelings, which I think is valid, which is, yeah, yeah, you got fucked on this, but let's help someone else out. What well, about here, the compassion? Here's the Because, difference. you know, um, uh, there are people that, worked really hard to not have student loans. Yes. And there are people that took them, um, there has to be somebody who took them frivolously. A hundred percent. I think quite a few. And I think it's also, we also should pay attention to the human mind and the development of the human mind and the frontal cortex. I mean, mm -hmm. The frontal lobe does not develop properly until you're 25 years old. Right. right? Or, so or some, you know, somewhere in that plus range. Plus or minus four it's, years. It's yeah. definitely not 17. It's definitely no. not 18. No. So you're taking on these fucking loans. You, 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 you can't be trusted with money or your future or thinking about what the fuck you're doing yeah. in terms of like taking on a debt of but hundreds of thousands of dollars. don't we have to, and this also ties in um, uh, with with. With, with sexual stuff as well, don't we have to decide when someone's adult and then give them that respect? Yes. Don't I, we have to I say, do. you're 18 years old, we, we, we can't control what decisions you make? Yes. I yes. Mean, and when is that year going to be? Because I, I think 25 is too old. I think 25 is too old as well. Yeah. But I think what we're saying is, I mean, look, there's a lot of 18-year-old people that make very good moral decisions. Yes. And we should we should praise that. Here's the problem with the student loan thing in terms of the that's the only loans that you never get exonerated from. You can get bankruptcy, 
right? And mm -hmm. you can get exonerated. You can you could escape the loans of credit cards, the debt of mortgages. You could ex escape a bad business collapsing and owing millions and whatever. You get, you could escape that through bankruptcy. You cannot do that with student loans. It's a corrupt system. You take a child who's trying to learn a trade or trying to learn uh, a profession and you ac acquire insane debt that's going to track you and cripple you for the rest of your life. And no matter what happens to you, you owe that money. But also you're taking your colleges out of the free market too mm. by, giving those, by giving those loans easily. Yes, and by having government help, yes, absolutely. you're also yes. you're also taking away the free market. Yes, because you know we found out that when you put the free market in, like LASIK surgery, when insurance doesn't cover it, it gets wicked cheap. Mm. You know, and if colleges had to be paid as people went without easy loans to get, and if colleges did not get government money, they might be wicked cheaper. I think they would I mean, be they're cheaper. Really, really expensive. I, I think crazy they are, expensive. Yes, crazy expensive. I think the real solution is in treating education like a, a thing that's going to make our society better, mm -hmm. and and think of it as the same way we think about the fire department, but, same way we think about police. But don't department. you think that? I mean, when you read the paper. There's always one whole thing about colleges getting too expensive and people can't go. Da, yeah. da, da, da. And then you turn 20 pages later in the paper, and there's an article about how online learning is going to hap is happening and how all this stuff is going to happen. Do you think that that idea of college is going to hold up for another 10 years? I think there's an experience that people I mean, have did you go, to college? go away. I did, but I, I went to college in my town. I went to UMass Boston, mm -hmm. and uh, I really only went because I didn't want to be a loser. I mean, uh -huh. It was really all it was. I was uh, doing martial arts and fighting and traveling all over the world or all over the country rather and, and thinking about doing stand-up at the time as well and then transitioning to doing stand-up while I was also still taking classes. I was learning nothing. It was a, a complete waste of time. I was only doing it so I could say, yeah, taking classes at UMass Boston, I was barely paying attention, barely showing up. And um, it was just a thing that I didn't want to tell people that I wasn't going to college. <laughs> like that was the number one reason why I did it. But I, but that was I had a unique life from the time I was, uh, you know, graduating from high school to the time I started doing stand up. I was obsessed with martial arts and competing, and that's all I wanted to do was make the Olympic team for Taekwondo. That's that was my goal, and that's what I was trying to do. So I wasn't a normal person. I wasn't like I wasn't going to go to Ohio and fucking travel over there and, and take a full course load and not be able to pursue what I wanted. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do was and also you've got a window I, athletically, I think, yes. athletically that's that's fairly and small. There's no, there was no scholarships for Taekwondo. It, was, mm -hmm. it doesn't it didn't exist. And the only other option was the army. There was a dude, uh, I think his name was Clay Barber, was this really talented guy who was a fighter who was uh, on the U.S. team at one point in time, I think, and he was uh, competing through the army. Like they, they had subsidized his training somehow or another, and I was thinking maybe I should join the army. Like that was the, other, the only other thing that I was thinking about doing. But um, for people, I think there's a thing about getting away from your parents. Getting away from them, getting away from their influence, being wild and crazy and be with a bunch of other kids and trying to find yourself. And I think that comes from traveling to a place and going to college. And I think there's, there's some benefit in that. I have friends that have had great benefit in that sort of uh, transformative experience of being on a campus, a physical campus in a place that's outside of their hometown where it gives them this new experience where they get to try to reinvent themselves. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. People, yeah. people do that. Being able to be someone else. Yeah. But I wonder... I wonder if all of that, why are we giving that a four-year period? Why isn't mm. that our whole lives? It, you know? it could be and it should be. And, and isn't think... that the way that's going to change? Because people aren't having jobs for their whole life anymore. And by the right. way, the liberal arts education was never supposed to teach people a trade. Right. It was always supposed to make it so that young men could talk. In, in at parties, yeah, that was the idea. <laughs> we could have the same cultural thing. We can talk about Shakespeare. We can talk about this. We can talk about that. But none of this was meant to give people jobs. Well, it's so rigid, right? You get out of high school. High school is this torturous affair where you're being a square peg. They're trying to shove into a round hole. Then you get out, and then they fly off to wherever the fuck you're going to go to school. And you go there, and you're forced with this overbearing workload of school and, and then social things. You're trying to figure out what's okay and what's not okay now. Where's the safe space? And 
well, am I, what am I, am I allowed to say this? And am I allowed to say that? And what are the new rules now for this new generation? Or are we really going to change the world? And then all of a sudden you're out in the, the world and you realize that fucking money that you spent mm -hmm. or that loan that you got is not getting you a job and you're fucked and you can't get a job and you're also massively in debt and severely depressed and trying to figure out your future. I mean, and this then you is go on Adderall. <laughs> and then you're like, I get it. They, we're setting people up. We're setting people up for a horrible failure. I am with Bernie Sanders in that I think education should be free. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think but you why, should earn it. I think you should have to earn it. How yeah. about if education is really cheap, like everything else is getting cheaper? Well, well, I, I mean, think TVs we pay, are really cheap. I think we could why pay for it with taxes. Why is education more expensive? I think we could pay for it with taxes. Or I may be pay, wrong. Or the individuals could pay for it. Maybe the individuals if it could, cheap if it made sense. If it yeah. made sense, yeah. I mean, if you want to learn something now, we know this very well. If you want to learn anything now, you can get it for free on the web. You definitely can. You many, definitely can. Many things. I mean. Other than physical things. There's a lot yeah. of th physical things that you need to be taught by a coach. Yep. But I think there's a lot of things you can learn online. And even yeah. the physical things. You can get a big chunk of it from online tutorials. I mean, what, 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 I mean let's let's talk about all that matters, okay? Let's talk about juggling. You know, Dude. I, I grew up as a juggler. When you were doing the taekwondo, I was juggling all the time. That's all I did, and that was my whole life was juggling. And what happened was, with the internet, juggling got tremendously better because people could watch videos of things they knew were possible and get better. If juggling could get better, physics certainly can. Yeah. It seems like you can take a course at any college online, and if you sincerely want to learn, you know, I don't know if we need to have this, what is what is the term called when the, when the Amish take their one year of Rumpelstiltskin or yeah, some shit? Yeah. <laughs> Rumspringer. Rumspringer. Rumspring. I don't think we need a nationally tax subsidized Rumspring right. for every person in the country. <laughs> that I seems don't think, like what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. You go to college, but you just described. Yeah. You do the da 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 da, yeah. da. It seems like live your fucking life. There isn't this four year magic period or this yeah. two year magic period and go out and learn the stuff you want to learn. I mean, um, you know, we both have children and they'll be talking about going to college. And of course, my, my, not of course, but my wife will push very hard for college. And my thinking is anything they want to learn, they can. They can just learn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and th by the way, this was also true with just the libraries in mm -hmm. local towns. Yeah. It's just more true now. It's even easier now. You know, I can't imagine growing up where my, my son can type in Lenny Bruce and it all just pops up. Right. I mean, you that was amazing. Record store. Order it. Order it. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, they didn't. Yeah. Gribbon's, Gribbin's Music Store in Greenfield, Massachusetts did not have the Carnegie Hall concert right there in the right. stacks. Yeah. I had to order. Oh, I, Frank Zappa, on back of one of his records, mentions Lenny Bruce and he's on Sgt. Pepper. I guess I should learn about him. Um, uh, Lenny, write that down. That's how I learned it? about Terrence McKenna. I learned about Terrence McKenna from listening to a Bill Hicks record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. like, who's this McKenna and what's well, a heroic dose? And, and, <laughs> and, and Frank Zappa, one of his records, I forget which it is, I think it's Freak Out, but it might be absolutely free, says on the back, do not listen to this song until you've read Franz Kafka in The Penal Colony. Oh. I got the record, opened it up. It said that. I listened to one side, got to that song, got on my bike, rode down to the Greenfield Public Library. Kafka, I got this written down, Kafka, in the penal colony. Sat there, read it, went back, listened to the record. My entire education starts with Mike Nesmith of the Monkees, who said, listen to Zappa, listen to Hendrix, from Zappa to Lenny Bruce, from Lenny Bruce to the whole world. Mm. And I believe that... Uh, that is available to everybody all the time. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know as I would say taxpayers should pay for college. I think I would say, do we need college? Isn't that fading away? I think there's a real benefit to being in a classroom with a brilliant professor. Yeah, yeah. I think there is. But we're also seeing with, with TED Talks, which I know are jive, but there is a there's a you say you know, there. You know their jive? I mean, there can be a lot of jive TED Talks. There's but, some jive TED Talks. Yeah. Yeah. But... What I'm saying is, I went to one of the first TED conferences and and and, and got to hear, um, you know, um, uh, all these credible people speaking. It was mind blowing, and I wasn't college age. 
I was, you know, I was whatever. I was 45 or something, 40. And it was it was an amazing experience. Jonas Salk, you know. I sat and listened to Jonas Salk talk. Really? I, I've been in a room with brilliant people speaking, and it's really, really great. Yeah. But I... I think we can we can deliver that cheaper. And that's the side of Bernie Sanders I want to talk about. It's not, can we give endless amounts of money to these fucking people on college campuses? Can we pay them all the money in the world to take our children and give them something to do in between smoke and dope? Could we rather just say, can't we make this experience cheap enough so that anybody can go and experience it? Why don't why why isn't it possible for you? for a few bucks to go and be in a room with a brilliant person. I think that would be a thing that would be beneficial to almost anybody at any point in time instead of the rigid structure yeah. of like, you know, this is, you, you know, you have to get all this work done by X amount of time. That's the other thing that happens to kids too. They're, they're taught about having no sleep and about beating your body up and about cramming and about getting all this work done in a short period of time. They're really, we're really preparing them for a horrible job. And all this shit that doesn't work. Yeah. You know, all that weird... Uh, that weird kind of hazing shit that we do for medical professionals. You're going to work for right, 48 hours. Right, what right, the right. fuck? It never works. Insane. It's it terrible never for the works. patient. It's bad for everybody. Yeah. You know, so my, and you just made the argument about the frontal cortex and you're not really ready till you're 25. I mean, one of the huge advantages I had in my life was a shitty, shitty education horrible education. You know, I went to a bad, bad, bad public school that had an influx of hippies from UMass that came in and experimented on us. <laughs> so we had no education whatsoever. I graduated from high school on a plea bargain. Uh, I had very good um, SAT, so I had scholarships to wherever I wanted to go, but I chose not to because I misunderstood Bob Dylan. I didn't know he was lying, so I went and hopped trains and hitchhiked around and lived homeless for a couple of years, and I never read Moby Dick till I was 45. Thank you. If I'd read Moby Dick when I was supposed to at college age, I wouldn't have gotten it. But I was able to get it at the right age. And now it's my favorite book because I was ready for it. You know, mm. uh, There's so many things that are on the curriculum that are very, very important. Maybe not that day. I think there's also an issue with people not thinking of education in terms of like that it's a lifetime pursuit. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not something that you graduate from college, then you're done. We really should be educating ourselves throughout life. Sure. Not, and not just accidentally or incidentally by experiences we should do it because w w there's things that we pursue that are interesting yes. and now is one of the greatest times ever to do that because of audiobooks you can do it while you're in the car you could do it while you're on the train you sure. can get educated and by you can also they're doing this weird connecting thing where i've not experimented with this but i'd love to where people take courses online and then find people who are also taking courses online in their communities and then meet it like a fucking Starbucks to mm. discuss what happened before uh, in the class, which is mind blowing that that can happen. Mm. So you can take, you know, uh, one of my huge, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to learn to play jazz, I wanted to learn to play upright bass. I took that up at 45 and I learned to play upright bebop bass passably. A huge accomplishment. And now I really want to learn a language, you know. So I was looking a little bit because I figured maybe there's a government watch list I'm not on. So I should learn Arabic. That was my thing. Because <laughs> don't you think that, that, that ticks all the boxes? That's going to give me everything if, yeah. I, if I just learn Arabic? Yeah, so I started Arabic looking into how I can learn, how I can learn uh, Arabic. And... Uh, it's amazing the kind of network that's developing all over the world to be able to learn anything. So my argument with you uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the Bernie thing of paying for everybody's college is I think we can get college so fucking cheap. You can go to college your whole life. Well, I don't think that's a bad idea. You know, if it's possible to get college that cheap, but I don't want professors to be poor. I mean, I think one of the real problems we have with public education is that people don't want to be a teacher because teachers don't get paid much. Sure, but there's a there's a way. There's a. I would say that's government intervention that's doing that. I would say if you government well, intervention is keeping the salary low. I think so. Really, I really think so because I think that we're not having enough of the of the of the of the competition and stuff there. Mm. I mean. Um, 
you know, you you would pay good money to be in a room with uh, Steven Pinker, you know? Yeah, sure. And I think that locally, this was always a problem that I never figured out. You know, when I was in Greenfield, Massachusetts, a uh, town of 20,000, I would say to all the other, uh, by other high school students, I would say, you know, if we didn't give our money to the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Dylan and all these other bands, we could pull our money together and have a really good local band. <laughs> we could have a great band right here in town, you know? And I think that if you thought of education that way, can't we get in our little area really great teachers who can teach this stuff? It might be pretty boss. Well, it would be amazing if we could spread education, right, through any any method, whatever we could do. If we could encourage people to be more educated. But I think that one of the best ways to do it really is just uh, – look, there's a lot of podcasts that are educating people. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, information that you can get Not that's mine. in entertainment. <laughs> But it's it, what we're getting is well, there's more information available now than ever before. I think it's very different than what college is traditionally. College is a thing where you go and it's a rite of passage. It's mm-hmm. like, and we don't have those in this world. And I think we could do with them. I think we could do with these rites of, particularly for young men. I don't I mean, maybe it's a case for young women. Obviously, I never was one. But when you're a young man, there's this transitionary period where you're a boy, and then all of a sudden, am I a man yet? Like mm-hmm. when am I a man? Certainly, a lot of uh, a lot of cultures and religions have, yes. have done that. Well, getting and we've out thrown and it getting away. that certificate and getting your diploma. Holy shit! I graduated from fucking university. Mm-hmm. I'm a man now. I'm a grown up. I have a degree. I'm a woman now. I have a degree. I'm yeah. an adult. And you're obviously, you know, uh, I'm I'm seeing this. You know, it's okay to speak with an accent. It's not okay to hear with one. Uh, I, I'm hearing that from someone who spent an awful lot of time uh, explaining to myself and others why I didn't go to college. You know, you wanted to show you weren't a loser. I didn't have that. I didn't say, I went to Ringley Brothers Barn and Bailey, greatest show on earth, clown college. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you want to make sure yeah. you don't get respect, that's where you go. Well, I'd say, I talk about it just because I want people to really know where my head was at. I don't want to like glorify no, no, where I'm not I talking was about, when I'm I was just saying, in college. I went without any rite of passage at all. Right. You know, and the closest I had to a rite of passage was earning my living. Well, Which it's was all, huge. you were also, you were on a different pursuit. Like mm-hmm. your pursuit was the carny pursuit and yeah. you, know, you enjoyed that. I mean, yeah. there was like a, you had, had a lust for it, Yeah, you know, and it obviously worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> it did okay. Listen, you really have to bail it too, because uh, yeah. it is two o'clock. Around now, yeah. Okay. Now. All right. Yeah. What are you doing? You just hanging out? Um, no, I'm going to go. Uh, do you watch the show uh, Perpetual Grace Limited? No, I never heard of it. Okay. What is um, it? Um, uh, uh, did you watch the show Patriot? Nope. Okay. Um, the best shows I have seen Are they fiction? on television. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not The Patriot, not Mel Gibson, but a show called What's Patriot. it on? Uh, Patriot is on uh, uh, Amazon Prime. Remember when there used to be like 20 shows? Yeah. <laughs> and you knew all of them? Yeah, now there's millions. It's impossible. Um, uh, so I am going to uh, meet and talk to the guy who created all all of those things. Oh, okay, it's, uh, cool. And, uh, there it is. Oh, perpetual Grace. Yeah, Perpetual Grace. There it is. Right oh, there. okay. And uh, I know it, that dude. Yeah. What's that dude's name? That's Ben Kingsley. That's right. And then that's Jimmy uh, Simpson. And that guy to the left is Jimmy Simpson. Yeah, that's who that, guy, that guy's great. I never knew who that guy is. Yeah. he's just always awesome. Yeah. What was he in recently? He was in something really good. Westworld. I think. That's right. Westworld. And, uh, Steve Conrad is the guy who writes, directs, produces, creates these shows. And uh, I uh, he happens to be in town, and I'm going to talk to him for my podcast, uh, which is Penn Sunday School. Ah. And I'm going to go to another studio and talk to him, and I'd already set up the time. So nice. that can't be uh, changed. But I he's, love uh, that Amazon's doing all these different shows. They're getting uh, into the stand-up comedy world now, too. Yeah, crazy. Oh, yeah, huge amounts, crazy. huge amounts, huge amounts. Beautiful. Amount. There's was yeah. so many pla- There's so much stuff, but there's so many places to put that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And uh, wow, what a great time. We've got to do this more often. we got to do this more often. Yeah. This is the first time we've done it. How is that possible? This podcast is almost 10 years old. Yeah. This is the first crazy. time you've been on. Crazy. And also because people yell at me. That's on Twitter, thing. go talk to Joe Rogan, you asshole. This is how fast time's going. When I did your radio show, I didn't have a podcast. That yeah. was more than 10 years ago. Yeah. Isn't that fucking crazy? Crazy. Flying. <laughs> Let's promise to do this once a year. Can we do that? At least. Let's do it. Okay, baby. Thank you, sir. Thanks Appreciate a lot, you. Man. Thank you. 
Bye, everybody. Is that the whole show without the internet?